Alan Briggs, CEO, Crisis Shield. Uh, as founder and owner of Crisis Shield, Alan Briggs leads his team to provide specialist advice, planning and training in crisis management, emergency management, crisis communications, and media management to businesses. Alan has delivered risk and crisis communications with major organisations Australia, UK, Asia, and America. Alan's experience is steeped in high profile crises and emergency situations having served 16 years with Victoria Police, where he rose to the rank of Sergeant and managed the Public Relations Unit. His work at Victoria Police and VIC SES taught him that strategically developing and testing plans, systems and processes is the best way to mitigate risks and manage issues and crises. So good afternoon, Alan, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Great, uh, thanks, Chris, and hi, everybody. Great to be online. and. I think I may have met some of you before uh, when we ran the media training across the state over the last five years. So uh, great to be on board and hope we can add some value. So without further ado, I've got about 20 minutes. We'll, uh, we'll kick off. Okay, so Chris has given a good round up of the, uh, the business. Like I said, we've been running uh, training across the whole state for the last uh, five years and are now doing a lot of work helping businesses um, during COVID-19. So first of all, I just want to um, probably start on a, a fairly positive note and gauging on what we've observed uh, around uh, Australia and internationally is that uh, when things open up, you guys are actually gonna get quite a rush and probably lucky or fortunate or good timing that we're opening up regional Victoria first. So you'll get a little bit of, a, a, I suppose, a test run uh, before you get the uh, the big onslaught from people from the city. And uh, I can tell you, we, all of us can't wait to get out of the city and get to regional areas. So you're going to get a fairly good um, surge when that comes through, which is great. So it's good for business, but it is going to come with some challenges. And now we want to be planning for those, not trying to respond from as they uh, come through the door. We just have uh, some things that have sort of come up for us and we've noted um, one of the ones is you're going to get these scenarios of people come in who are, are anti-vaccination, conspiracy theorists, um, propaganda, pandemic, Illuminati, Black Lives Matters, anti-maskers, and people with high stress levels. And you know the reality is this is rightly or wrong. We're not, not here to debate that, but that's um, who make up our community and who are the so people that are actually going to come out and visit our our um, venues now, um, places to stay. So we've got to keep that in mind as people coming through the doors. We're going to get a real blend or mixture of people coming in with different um, views on what has or hasn't been done and what the situation is. Um, now you're going to get these type of things too, people coming through, whether you should, should or shouldn't wear a mask. Some people are going to be very uh, adamant that you should be wearing a mask. Other ones will think that it's totally you know, um, silly or not required. Uh, vaccination the same. Some people are very comfortable doing temperature checks, other people will probably push back and not want to have them. Um, we've had infection outbreaks already in a lot of workplaces and, and, uh, and other places. So we are starting to get familiar with that, but um, that's something that's sort of coming out into um, in experiencing for us now. And the other thing, we want to know what our legal position is. And uh, I think it's been fascinating watching what's um, uh, been happening here, particularly in Melbourne, when there's been an issue and people are challenging the, the law around that. So um, one of the high recommendations I've got is if you're very clear your position, we'll talk about that shortly, but you're very clear in your position, it uh, gives you great comfort. You know before the person asks those questions where you stand on that issue. So um, very good to have that quite clear. Just some of the current landscape we've got too. Um, there's a lot of fear out there that you know people are going to catch COVID, um, potentially um, get quite ill or die. Um, they're unsure about the rules and regulations. So I'm just trying to pretext the sort of what's happening to the people who are coming to, to you. Uh, there's a lot of conflict out there and messaging that was coming from state and federal and other agencies. Um, that's starting to flatten out a bit now, but that has been a challenge. Um, so they're mixed messengers. The other thing is the unknowns. A lot of people are just not sure um, you know, what's happening and, and what it, how it affects them. And this is a new event. So um, quite often use that uh, tagline, you know, that there was no rule book made for this. So it is a new event we're all working through. <clears throat> now, these are some of the considerations that we need to think of as we come through. It's good that Natasha sort of flagged how to actually manage when you've got an outbreak, but 
you know, the thing is that we could have an infected person, whether it's a staff, contractor, visitor, uh, someone that's staying with us. Um, some of the context that's put around, if it's fake news or it's perception. So um, quite often people are looking what's happening in the media and, and some and social media particularly, undertaking some people won't trust it at all. And other thing people take that as being the gospel truth. So, you know, I've got a bit of um, challenge within that. The other thing is that we've got three tiers of government and I want you to also be conscious that you've got not only a federal government, we've got state government and local government. So we've got three tiers. I've got to uh, make sure that we're aligning to those when we're moving forward with our position, um, the, what we're pl putting in place that aligns to those three tiers. Um, the people coming down are possibly going to be quite stressed. we have be doing a lot of training for people in the um, city at the moment about return to work and particularly around their security and front of house staff, that the people coming in are going to be reasonably stressed due to the isolation, and it could be uh, alcohol, drug abuse, it could be uh, domestic violence, uh, financial stress. So in a sense, when people are coming to approach you, they're, they're pretty wound up. So we're just trying to give you that sort of um, pre-warning, um, that sort of situation. Um, and the other thing we've just flagged here is racism. We could see that as well, that some people um, have some views about um, the cause of it or um, what should have been, how it should have been managed. So. Once again, we've just got to park these things and be mindful that they all apply. So what we can do, so I think this is the critical point for us, for you guys. Um, number one, you, we need to have a COVID-19 plan. Now there's uh, a lot of documentation as uh, Natasha said on the website. Um, you should already have a draft plan uh, put together. Um, you've got some really good resources within the um, uh, tourism uh, board to go back to them and run it past them, place, places like ourselves and obviously the government website. So absolutely you need to have a COVID-19 plan. The next one is you need to have a prepared position on masks, vaccination, social distancing. So when someone comes in and say, well, look, I'm not going to wear masks because I don't have to, or I don't vaccinate, whatever the case may be, that you're very clear what your position is. So going through that, and our recommendation on that is that you are obviously aligning with, not obviously, but aligning with what the government regulations are. So having that position is very important. Uh, align with the state and your local government is very important. And team up with local tourism board because they can give you a lot of help around, there might be the little nuances within your industry. Uh, so when you're saying, well, that, that's very good and well, but we operate something that's a little bit different. We're on a boat or you know, we're, we're hiring out surfboards. How does that apply? So. Be very clear working with them but you need to have a position on that now the other thing i say um and in crisis manager i say prepare for the worst and hope for the best so my view is that everyone should be planning on an outbreak i have in my office here all our clients we say look just work on the, the uh, premise that you're going to have an outbreak and communicate that to people so that we work on that we are prepared for an outbreak um, we're putting everything in to mitigate that it won't happen, but we're quite aware that that could happen and we're prepared for it. So I think that's a better position to be in than hoping it won't happen. And when it does happen, you're caught out. So work on premise, it'll happen and you're prepared. Now I know this is my car. So I thought I'd throw this in because this happened two weeks ago. Uh, prepare, anticipate the unexpected. Uh, I've been banging on about this since uh, the start of the year and uh, it, it, it hit me. So what happens, you uh, we're all sort of COVID-19 focused and the reality is a lot of you are now moving into the summer season and you know, if it's not sharks down by the beach, but it could be uh, bushfires, we still get floods and storms, sex assaults, uh, food contamination. So other things can still happen. We certainly want to be focused, prepared for COVID-19. But we also need, in my case, it was not a left field, but right field. An Uber driver came through a giveaway sign, you know, in, a, in three cars on the road, and I managed to uh, collect him. So fortunate not injured or anything, but it just was a bit of a wake-up call for me. Anyhow, that, um, you know, other things just totally um, unprepared for, well, not unprepared, but unexpected can happen. Now, just some action points I thought, and I thought Natasha was good, she touched on is, is looking at split shifts. Now, if you've got a small office, I appreciate that is very difficult to start splitting your shifts. What you should look as a contingency is that if we did have a full outbreak and our whole office had to be um, going to isolation, then who could we bring in as a second team to run that office? So you might have 
you know, if it's a small business, a uh, husband, wife or partner, one of you may have to do the second shift. So it's going to be a bit challenging, but it might be what you have to do for a while and have some of your key people are on a rotation or a roster. So if you have an outbreak there, you can at least bring in a secondary team. Uh, social distancing. So what does that mean? If you're running, you've got a reception uh, counter at a caravan park or a motel, hotel. Uh, here in the city, there's plenty of signage with, you know, keep apart. Um, they're putting barriers up so you can't get too close to the counter. Um, lifts, we're limiting to two, per, two people per lift. So putting that signage up, I'm a big believer in educating people before they get there. So um, people, for example, might be coming down, you know, say to them, look, uh, when you come down, there's no need for you actually come into the office. Um, we'll leave the key in the door or call us and we'll come out into the um, reception area or the car park and we'll give you the keys to your cabin or to your room. And that way it minimizes the contact that they'll have. Uh, deep cleaning regularly. Uh, I think that's, you know, it's good. It's a good practice and particularly at the moment. A uh, few people asked about the cleaning and I, when this first started, everyone kept talking about the deep clean. I'm like, what's a deep clean? So I did a bit of homework and I found uh, Safe Work Australia have a really good explanation of what a deep clean is. So if you go through there, everything about fabrics, metal services, glass, plastic. So that gives you a really good spec. The other thing I'd highly recommend is you actually go in your local community, find out who can actually do a deep clean, what, how long does it take to call them out, um, and giving them a, uh, like a spec list, if you like, of what you'd expect them to do. Because if I'm looking at coming down to your um, accommodation or your uh, tourism event, and uh, you say I've done a deep clean, I go, well, what does that mean? If you can say, well, I've been to work, say, here's a list of what we've done, we've contracted it out or we've done it ourselves, and here's a list, we've got a checklist here, we've gone through everything, ticked it all off, these are the chemicals we've used, because some people actually um, can be um, allergic to some chemicals as well. So uh, this deep clean, uh, do a little bit of work on that, what needs to be cleaned, um, how are you going to clean it, what chemicals, and if you're not doing it yourself, who you could outsource it to do, what's it going to cost, so you know that, and what's their availability. Uh, distribution of PPE, as we know, that's been a, a quite a, a big issue um, in uh, hospitals and other places. So getting a, a good supply of PPE is important. So you can give that to your staff, particularly if they're customer facing, um, they're you know, handling food or other equipment. So having that available and, and keeping a pretty strict um, order on that too. Um, the thing that sort of concerns me with saying is once people start coming back, um, you know, we're just we're human by nature and we'll fall back into our old habits of, you know, there'll be 10 people in the lift and people will be hugging and touching, which is sort of our normal nature. We're going to try and refrain from that. We'll certainly be well uh, kitted up with um, PPE. Uh, Sanitisation, once again, having that regularly available um, in the lifts and the foyers, certainly in reception. Uh, a lot of places now have got a little hand one in a, in a little hand, uh, holder. So it's fairly available for people. Uh, car parking, another one, just having that, um, so the car park is uh, readily available. Um, particularly in the city, we're seeing a lot of people saying, well, when I do start coming back to work, I'm not going to use public transport. Uh, I'm going to actually come down in my car. So we're anticipating not only in uh, metro, but in regional areas, less use of buses and those type of transport, probably a lot more use around public, their own car um, to be a bit more isolated. Uh, as I said earlier, office rotation is very important so that um, you've got um, a good redundancy or B team or secondary team. So if you get an infection outbreak, this, the next team can come in. Uh, we're just putting here town hall meetings. If something does happen, um, we're finding that social media, while it's a good communication tool, it can also be a good place to spread uh, misinformation. So as soon as something outbreaks and it's out on socials, you want to get onto that and correct it. And we are finding a very powerful way to do meetings is we call the town hall meeting. Now, if you run a small, um, you know, small tourism venue, town hall meeting might only mean half a dozen or 20 of you. That's fine, but you get everyone in and it's a um, single source of truth. They can ask questions and you can um, put all those fears and everything and be quite clear what you're doing. So we find those meetings are very good. Limiting socialising, so this is going to be a challenge and when you're coming and opening up, um, people can get into, particularly if it's an accommodation, they can go into their rooms and they're fairly self-isolated there. But if they come out into the social areas, whether it be the bar, the restaurant or the foyer, lobby, those areas, um, trying to limit that amount of socialising. So you should be already going through measuring up your area, knowing how many people you can actually accommodate, 
um, having a counter and an eye on that. And once you're on the limit, um, getting people to stay out until you do that rotation. And once again, this is all, and I've got there the monitoring of that. It all comes back to the communications. When I'm ringing up to make a booking, it's very clear, look, we, we are running the, the bar or the restaurant, but we have a limited capacity and uh, you'll have to do a booking for that. You can't just wander in like you would have in the past and just grab a table or a seat at the bar. Um, back to basics um, in, in the communication, keep it clear and consistent and early comms. So are we really, and working with the, with the industry, you guys, it's no, I just imagine a scenario, I've, I've left Melbourne, I've driven down to, to Gippsland, um, I've got to even to Mallacoota or down to Lake Centrance or down the Great Ocean Road, down, you know, to Lawn or um, um, Wye River, I used to go there a lot. And I've driven all the way there, I turn up at the, the um, place and they do a temperature check and I say, sorry, your temperature's too high. You can imagine my frustration, first time I've got out of the city, I've driven for a few hours and told I can't stay there. So I think it's very important. We, you don't want to be in that position and, and certainly the people coming down don't want to be in that uh, position. So the more communication we can do before they leave home. So when they're booking in, so look, this is what we will do when you come down. We will be doing a temperature check. We will expect you to wear a mask when you're in the close proximity to other people. I want to see all based on the government guidelines. Um, we will ask that you're not at all going down into the recreation room or the restaurant. So giving the people a very clear message that this is what the expectation is when they come down and this is that will be enforced. So people are doing that journey um, and getting a bit of a fright if you like when they arrive. Uh, and everything goes that it's, it's communicating with them when they're making the booking, that's on your website, uh, on your socials, and that it's also going through like hire car companies. If you've got buses that come down bringing people down, it's with them, um, with booking agencies. So people are quite clear when I come down, this is what's going to happen, quite clear. Uh, once again, need a firm position on the plan. So when something happens, you need to communicate this with your staff and your key stakeholders. So when it happens, you, you've told them, if we get an outbreak or um, something happens, this is what we'll do. So it's very clear. People aren't going, oh, we didn't know what was going to happen. It was or they start panicking. They go, look, we're working on the premise that we could get an outbreak. And if we do, we've got an absolute solid plan. Uh, we'll activate that plan. And this is what it'll look like. And then we'll come back to business as soon as we're allowed to. So everyone's quite clear. And as I said, share that vision or that strategy early on before it happens. Then when it does happen, people aren't sort of panicked or think, oh, look, we weren't prepared for this. Yeah, we knew that this could happen and here's the plan. Uh, it's a new way of working. Um, we're also looking for cost savings. So it's, you know, it's been absolutely devastating for the industry. So you know, we've got to see how we can um, be creative in the way the things you do and going once again back to the industry, what else can we do to try and make this more um, uh, cost savings, but still uh, make ourselves profitable. Um, and I think I, the main thing I've said there is uh, preparing for everything. So we've still got a COVID plan, but we're also preparing for uh, coming into bushfire season, so got floods, storms, and other events that could happen. Um, I won't show this, I can't, it won't play in, a, in the Prezi, but if you ever look on the Marriott CEO um, speech, uh, this was back in March this year. It is amazing. And he, as you can imagine, the Marriott uh, hotel chain, absolutely you know um just had a horrific um impact from covid and he gave a very powerful and emotive speech so um i can share it in a link with you but i think it was just really worth watching about a ceo who took ownership gave clear direction acknowledged we've got a, a you know a tough time ahead of us but was very uh, very powerful so I'll, I'll share that link with you in a minute worth watching All right, so I think I'll um, try and I've noticed I'm, we're just about on time. Um, to close off, I just think it's um, important just to re recap there that um, you've got a clear plan. We work on the, exp or anticipate that we will have an outbreak and we've, we're quite clear about how we'll respond to that. Um, keep monitoring your socials. It, what, it did come up before that um, what happens if you get an outbreak, you know, you don't want to uh, declare it. Um, and I can see the reasons behind that, but. There's a chance the media will get onto it. My view be on the front foot, outbreaks are gonna happen a lot. I mean, over the next year or two, it's gonna become a very common thing. And people, in a sense, I think will sort of almost like brush it off. So 
what I want to see, and I think the public want to see, if you have an outbreak, you're up there. So we've had a confirmed case, uh, we've closed, we've conducted our deep clean, and we're reopening in 24, 48 hours as, as we're required uh, by the Department of Health and Human Services. So being very on the front foot, uh, clear, concise, yep, we've had that, um, we had the plan, we've done it, and we're back in action. The booking started in 24 hours. That gives people comfort. It's worse when we hear rumours or it's been told and we're sort of not declaring anything. So I think be on the front foot, be proactive. People are out now expecting it. We've seen multiple outbreaks here in, in the Melbourne and we're going to see them out in regional areas and, and as we have in interstate. So be on the front foot. We're working with aged care and as you can imagine a lot of outbreaks there or what we can see. So being proactive about it certainly working a lot better. All right, I think I'll uh, just about close for me. So I'll hand back to you, Chris, so we can take some questions. No, thank you, Alan, a, a, a great presentation. And we're getting a lot of positive remarks in the, in the comments field, which is always nice. Um, one question that came to my mind that has been asked as well, what is the best way to handle those media inquiries if there is an outbreak? Yeah, my, my view, if you had an outbreak and, and it's confirmed, um, it's in a public domain. If, if the media have called you, someone knows about it. Um, it's pointless saying, look, we can't confirm or deny. If you've got it, yes, absolutely. We've had, we have had a confirmed outbreak here. We have now, we had a COVID-19 plan. We have now contacted the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we are now going through our process. We're having a deep clean. Um, we've closed or we've got a rotational staff and we're now opening, um, we're closed for the next 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever the case may be. We're reopening. If you've got a booking, here's our hotline or phone number to call. Being proactive about it. People are anticipating this. It's not going to be, um, it's just not going to be uh, unusual. It's if you are a bit unsure about it, then I would say, look, I'm not sure if I'll go, they'll go somewhere else. Mm, yeah, very true. Um, throughout your presentation, there's a lot of great examples in there from hospitality and uh, accommodation providers. Um, obviously a big sector of the industry is tour and transport, which obviously have their own uh, sets of considerations that they need to think about when thinking about their planning. Um, any thoughts or any comments around uh, recommendations for that particular sector? Yeah, you're talking like a bus, like bus tour? Yeah, tour operator where they've actually got to pick up a group of people um, and doing a, a winery tour or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Once, well, key thing, early communication. Uh, we're following government guidelines. Now, you might even impose some further guidelines. So, for example, you must wear a mask while you're on the bus. Um, if you're using the, you know, the toilets or change rooms, you've got to sanitise your hands. Uh, so if you do a stop along the, along the, the tour, um, you say to people when you're off the bus, depending what the local arrangements are there. And, and once again, finding what they are out to. So look, we're arriving at the winery, they'll expect you to wear a mask or sanitise, keep your social distance. So to me, the more you can educate, so there's no surprises. And so to people, look, we, we have to do this to make sure we can operate. Um, we're not here to argue about whether it's right or wrong. This is how we have to do to operate. We really appreciate your um, supporting this so that we can, we can all go on this tour or we'll undertake this. Mm. You want to also show that you're visibly doing things. So, you know, you're cleaning the handles. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of sanitizer around. There's masks available. So that people feel like, yeah, these people are taking it legitimately. You don't want the driver, for example, the bus says, everyone wear a mask and then they take theirs off because then it sort of all falls apart. While the people are waiting to get on the bus, they're waiting at the booking agency. You want that pe the people there to explain, look, you're about to go on a tour down the Great Ocean Road or in the high country. They will expect you to wear a mask. They'll need you to sanitise. Um, this is now our requirement for your safety. Big thing when you're always doing messaging, it's not about um, it's not about your business. It's about them. I've always people get engaged when they hear it's about them. So for your safety, we want to look after you. Um, that's why we're taking these measures. And people feel, oh, yeah, okay. So always, and once again, having your position, if you get someone says, I'm not wearing a mask, um, for example, then you say, look, unfortunately, we ha can't take you on this tour because that's one of our requirements. Yeah, and that's a question that just come up is, can you legally refuse someone to um, entry because yep. they're not wearing a mask? Well, it, there's two levels here. There's, and it'd be good to get uh, Natasha's position, but if there's one the government has declared, for example, in Melbourne CBD, you have to, once you're outdoors, you've got to wear a mask. So that's a no brainer. You can say, well, I, by law. So if you don't, I can ring the police. Um, and you, you, you know, there's an offence for that. 
Now, if you've been imposed that as a, a secondary precaution, um, you've still got the right to say to somebody, well, I'm not letting you on our tour because that's our requirement. Now, that's a call. This, once again, I said, you ought, you ought to think about this positioning before you open up and say, what are the government guidelines? Well, what they are, we have to comply. Like it or not, whether they're right or wrong, that's the, the, the fact. So we've got to comply with them. If there isn't anything there and you decide, I'm going to create more social distancing or I'm going to, uh, I want people to wear masks or they must clean their hands, you've got to be clear. And then you've got to communicate that very well. We even put this in as an additional layer for safety uh, and that's our requirement. If you want to come on our tour, if you want to stay at our accommodation, you want to use our services, that's the rules we have. Mm. And you do, you have a right to say, it's a bit like if you, you know, you go into a, you know, the old nightclub and I say, I'm not letting you in because you've got the wrong coloured shirt on. That's their rules. Yeah. And I think this really comes back to that whole, the, 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 the example you provided before around people traveling four or five hours to stay in accommodation and they get temperature checked. Mm -hmm. So having a firm policy in place that, you know, you've got a means of answering those requirements, you know, do you get them to sit aside for 15 minutes, then re temperature check, you're sat in the cup four hours, a bit warmer and you had kids yelling at you, your probably temperature is going to be higher. So having those processes in place are, are critical to ensure that, Everyone's on the same page and everyone knows where their um, expectations lie. Yeah, and, and communicating that before they leave home. So as I drive out the driver, I know when I arrive at that destination, I will get a temperature check. I'll be expected to put a mask on. I'll be expected to do social distancing. Whatever your, your um, requirements are, I know before I even leave the front of my home what they will be. So there's no surprises when I turn up. Mm. Yeah. Um, Got a question here. I'm not sure if it should be towards you or more aimed at DHHS, but if you have a positive case, um, I assume that as part of a communication is to advise other businesses in town that they've had a positive case. So I suppose there's a question in that itself. Um, then ask, can we share details of the person who was positive with other businesses to determine if they were on their visitor list? I'd assume that would come down to DHHS's responsibility, not the business owners. But, yeah. But, um, yeah, my view on that, and look, I, I would prefer that to touch a bit. I, my feeling is, in my opinion, if you like, and this is just my opinion, that, that those two questions would be answered by DHHS. It shouldn't be your obligation to tell other businesses that you've had a uh, confirmed outbreak, and it shouldn't be your obligation to say, identify who the person is. So, for example, if you've had, say, a distributor come in who delivers, I don't know, the milk, um, and they've, they've become a, a positive case, um, it's the DHHS should be doing the notification, not you. Yeah. 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 Because the other thing I'll pre preface on that too, if you do go out and start doing that and you've got the identity wrong or it ends up being a negative case, you could be actually liable. It's not, not your role. Your role is within your business unit and your, that's your responsibility. Once you get out your, outside your front door or your, your farm gate, um, somebody else. Mm. There are a couple of questions coming in which are probably more aimed around the, the social distancing on tours and how they do that on buses. So I know the guidelines have um, only just been, some of the guidelines have only just been released today, which would hopefully help to um, uh, explain some of these uh, challenges that obviously businesses who are having to maintain social distancing on a bus for 24 people can be a challenge. So um, we'll take some of those offline for participants. And um, I know we do have Stuart uh, Topless on the line here as well. Um, so we'll take those offline and um, can hopefully answer those in, in due course. Just on one day, um, just two things. One is that uh, for, uh, a mate of mine, a, a business colleague, he just flew back to Canberra this morning, uh, hopped on a small aircraft, 12 people, and he, they were sitting next to each other. <laughs> and, you know, like, you're going to be pretty close on the plane. Now, they're masked up. They had to wipe their hands. Our temperature checked. Um, it's a reality. We're going to get close to people if we're on a bus or other things. So what can you do? You know, it's a mask. It's keep, keeping you know, good hand sanitization. A lot of visibility to, I mean, you're doing it with intent, but showing people as they're sort of coming on, someone going down, wiping down the handrails and everything. So, look, these people are trying to keep this place as clean as they can. If I was running a bus, I'll be stopping probably, and look, I'm just giving an estimate, probably every hour and a half, two hours, and opening the windows up and just airing it out. If you've got all those people sitting in a bus, um, and one of the things we're recommending in the city here is getting a lot more outside air, uh, recirculating through the office. 
So no different if you're in a bus or a closed mm. venue is to try and open up to get a lot of circulation. If you've got someone infected and you've got a really nice tight, um, everyone else has got a higher chance of, of catching it. Mm. Um, there is a question. I don't know whether uh, it might be worth bringing Stuart on the line for this one because I haven't heard where they've landed with um, the temperature checking and things like that. But there is a question around, do you need to temperature check all guests per, per, per room prior to them into a room? Is that, is that going to be a, a requirement? Is that something that we're going to need to be doing as part of our um, COVID safe plans moving forward? You know, Stuart, I don't know if there's any, you got any advice on that one. I know you're, you're, you're sitting there and um, maybe scratching your head yourself. Um, thanks, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my understanding is that it'll be part of the customer screening process. It's the um, not a mandatory obligation, but would be uh, some way in which you can look at ways of minimising the risk of transmission in your business. Uh, that will be covered in the guidelines is my understanding. If it isn't, we can definitely get clarity on that as soon as possible. Can I just jump in there, Chris? My view on this is I'm a, quite a uh, pragmatic sort of person. The whole purpose we're wearing masks and sanitizing, uh, social distancing is we're not um, spreading it and infecting another person. If I'm running a, an Airbnb, and uh, for example, or a cabin, and the person can come down, go to that cabin, uh, they're in the cabin, uh, they're not coming into our, you know, the main building and, and I've had a, a proper clean, deep clean when they, before they arrive and after they go. Um, temperature checking and mask and gloving them up really doesn't matter. They might as well be in their own home. We're not having much contact. If I've got a venue where they're coming in and there's a bar or a restaurant or a, a you know, games room and you've got people mixing, they're at a higher risk and that's where we're going to start looking at temperature checks. Um, mask wearing and social distancing. So really, you know, apply common sense. We don't want this thing spreading and we, we've been told how it spreads. So if someone's remote, we're not having any contact with them, you know, we can be, we can reduce the um, levels of protection if you like. And the closer, the more confined they get. Uh, like for example, in the bus, we're gonna have to be a lot more uh, vigilant and increase the level of um, protection. Mm. Now, some really great, um tips and advice there alan and uh thank you Stu, for jumping on as well and um again thank you to t for their um participation or assistance with this webinar today so uh today's webinar has been brought to you in partnership with the guys at teeth so um thank you to, uh, the team there have been doing some really hard work and you know, we work really closely with the guys so um obviously over the last few days with restrictions changing and stuff there's been a lot of hard work that's been going on behind the scenes and uh, those guidelines have just been released so um thank you to uh alan for your session thank you to natasha as well who's ducked off to something else and also thank you to Stu and your team for everything that you do